Hey, y'all. I'm Mitch Lawrence. And I'm his wife, Leah Lawrence. And you are listening to the Southern Spirits Podcast, where I occasionally regale my wife with Southern stories of the macabre, creepy, and strange. And I drink. All right, Leah, what are we drinking this week? Um, Today, we are drinking beer and whiskey, and I will tell you exactly what type, because that is my job now. Um... <laughs> So, for our beer this week, we are going to be drinking um, Fade Into, brewed and canned by Westbrook Brewing Company in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, for Sun Lab Brewing Company in Matt. Miami, 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 Florida. Miami. <laughs> uh, it's 5.7 alcohol by volume. Um, and their Sun Labs cans don't say like anything at all on them, basically. So we'll read the online untapped description. All right. All right. The description is American sour ale brewed with apple, pear, and dates. Crisp apple blended with juicy pear for a fruity bite and a touch of sweetness from the dates to balance it out. Uh, the first things that I said after I I sipped it was oh my god that's fucking delightful yeah um, it and is. it is it just tastes like sort of tangy apple juice and i'm here for it um it's not a cider but it, it's it's got more of a sour i don't know it's a really wonderful blend of sweet sour tangy it gives me super apple cider vibes but more sour than that um i'm a fan 10 out of 10 100 percent would recommend. I wish they came in bigger packs. Uh, this might be one of my favorite new beers. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like sweeter beers, and I love a sour. So yeah. it's like that is one of my ideal beers. Um, it's wonderful. It's very very good. Um, and then for our liquor this week, we're going to be doing the Bird Dog Salted Caramel Flavored Whiskey, bottled for Western Spirits by Three Springs Bottling Company in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It's 40% alcohol by volume. Uh, similarly to the Sun Lab, uh, Bird Dog doesn't have anything on their bottles, so we'll read the online description. It says, if you're always on the hunt for that perfect balance of salty and sweet, then your search ends here. Our bird dog salted caramel flavored whiskey has signature caramel notes complemented by subtle hints of sea salt, keeping the sweetness at bay and highlighting vanilla and oak undertones. Um, I gave it a 9 out of 10 on ice. Dogs barking very loudly. Oh man. Sorry. That was a howl. Go ahead. Right. I don't think Samus likes the bird dog, or maybe she's taking the bird dog name to heart. She's very upset. Just go ahead. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, I gave it a 9 out of 10 on ice. Um, I didn't really taste the saltiness of it, but there is just, it's a really smooth, um, nice caramel flavor. Uh, You do taste the alcohol in it, but it's not like astringent or strong. It's just a nice, smooth caramelly whiskey and i like it a lot um the description like the not a description a suggestion the suggestions for like cocktails on their website are like put it in a white russian put it in um some of their apple whiskey and like just drink it on ice so i am drinking a cocktail thank you very much according to their website and the cocktail is just it and an ice ball so um, it's really nice uh 10 out of 10 no I put it a 9 out of 10 because I didn't taste the salt. Um, I can't read my own notes, y'all. It's been a long fucking week. Um, But yeah, those are our alcohols. And I think you're going to really enjoy the shot if you have to take it. Um, It's it's really nice. Um, Excellent. And I, I like caramel anyway. Caramel anything is just my my favorite. So Yeah, it is very good. I had one sip of it. I really enjoyed it. So I am all for you enjoying it as well and i also uh, think that i'm gonna put it in some we bought some apple cider um like a week ago like a gallon of it at the grocery store um and i'm gonna mix that with the mulling spices and then after like i've heated it up i'm gonna make like a caramel apple hot toddy and it's gonna be really good that sounds wonderful i'm just very excited about that so Yeah. yeah all right well we're done with the alcohols yes that was the alcohols okay well since I have to do this this week, uh, it's been a very busy week and Lee yeah. didn't have a chance to put stories together. So she gave me topics again. Um, what we're going to do first, though, we're going to do our sassy Southern saying, Leah. Huzzah. Are you ready for it? I'm so ready. Okay. I would guess that you've heard this because you've heard everything yes. and you catalog them. 
Um, that is the way my brain works. Have you ever heard, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear? Yeah, and we've already done that one, but... No, we haven't. I searched it. Really? I searched it. It hasn't fucking been done. Maybe we haven't done it just because I thought that we had already done it. But yes, I do know what that means. And I used to be able to say that phrase in Latin, because one of my Latin teacher's uh, things was to like give us common phrases, God damn it, but you did in Latin. Use it. Fuck. <laughs> You did use it. I told you we have. God damn it, Leah. <laughs> Everything sucks. <laughs> Look, I am very, like... I searched. I searched. I searched. One of my special interests is is idioms and, and um, like, phrases and uh, metaphors, similes, common language. I find it endlessly fascinating. Um, and, and that is a, a saying that, like I said, I... I know very well, but you go ahead. I don't think everybody knows what it means, and probably everybody doesn't listen to all of these episodes, so go for it. I'm very upset. <laughs> like, I searched for it, and I didn't find it. But I'm sorry. What it means, I'll just directly quote it, since I do, it doesn't fucking matter anymore. A pig's ear may look soft, pink, and shiny, but you're not fooling anyone by calling it your new Mark Jacobs bag. A southerner might say this about her redneck cousin who likes to decorate his house with deer antlers. So there you go. You can't make something fancy by giving it bullshit put into it. That's basically all that it's it, all that it's saying. I, kind of uh, more etymologically sound though. It means um, um, just take over. Yeah, it, for the love of God. I'm sorry. <laughs> it it means more like if you're starting out with bad materials, you're never going to make something that is luxurious. You know right, what I mean? That's like what I said. it's not. It is. If you're starting out with shit uh, ingredients, the final product isn't going to be spectacular. So you've got to use something that you know. Try as you might, if you start with shitty ingredients, you're not going to end up with a, a finished product that's worth a damn. So <clears throat> yeah, that's what yeah. I said. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. All right. Well, then you were correct, and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm sorry. Leah. I'm just very upset. I searched <laughs> in our drive for that. Didn't find it. Yeah. But, Sometimes that drive is a little irritating when it comes to, to yeah. you know, searching, seeking out. Like, it, I've repeated myself before, so don't worry about it. I know you have. I was there for that, but <laughs> I don't think you searched that. No, probably not, but... Uh. Also, we're getting close to running out of common phrases like that, and we're so running into just the weird else. shit that I know about. So we should probably transition into something else. I don't you started know what. with the place names, so yeah. now we've done the sayings. So now, again, sassy southern sexual positions. We've gone over this. <laughs> we're not doing sassy southern <laughs> sexual positions. Yeah. Uh, well. I've thought about superstitions. Someone uh, said something about doing yeah. like recipes. Um, which I think would be fun. I don't know. I don't want to do recipes specifically, but like maybe like because, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I don't know. I think what would be endlessly entertaining would be going through the church cookbook and listing off some of the absurd names of the, of the, <laughs> the recipes. recipes. <laughs> I just want there to be like jello mold month where we just do everything <laughs> that was suspended in jello in the 50s. Through the 70s. It'd be perfect. Paula May's hot, hot uh, cracker uh, dumpling soup, you know, just some weird shit that's just like, and it's always some like super country grandma names, insert recipe here that make like, yeah. it's, oh man, flipping through old church cookbooks is the most hilarious experience of my Thanksgiving, but yeah. whatever. And I just thought about something. We should tell a story before we start. Go ahead. So um, <clears throat> we're recording this on Sunday. Uh, later in the day on Sunday, and so it'll be out today, later, because yesterday Leah had a holiday market here in town that she had to, she didn't have to, she signed up for and attended, sold a whole bunch of ornaments that she's made with her laser, and she took a bunch of one-off stuff to put on a little tree there to show, hey, I can do custom orders, I can do special things, and one of them was a Bigfoot ornament that she made. If y'all haven't seen it before, it's got a little Christmas pun on it. And it's what what was the pun on that one? Um, have yourself a hairy little Christmas. There you go. And it was just a, a nice ornament. A lot of people came by and said things about that one specifically, but all the other ones on there. That's very pretty. What That's cute. That's funny. One lady had to have that Bigfoot ornament. So Leah sold it to her. And uh, our friend Amberly was showing her the rest of the tree. And she said, oh, look, she's got a Nessie one here, too. What's the Nessie one say on it? Uh, so be good for good Ness's sake. There you go. 
And she showed her the Nessie one, this old white lady here in Hartzell. And she said, if you like that Bigfoot one, here's here's one with Loch Ness on it. And the lady goes, oh, I don't believe in that one. And everybody stopped talking. And we went, all right, okay. man, here's your, here's your $10 ornament. Thank you. you. Have a good rest of the day. She wanted Bigfoot because she knows. Yeah. Bigfoot is totally, like, completely real in her heart. And that's great. Like, I feel great for her. But, like... Yeah, just completely dismissive of my favorite cryptid. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah. Like me neither, but you don't have to harsh my buzz about her. Thanks. Mm-hmm. That was it was No, I don't believe in that one. I, and it was just so matter of fact. <laughs> it wasn't rude or anything. It was no, just No, it was just no, like very specifically one. like I don't believe moved, in that the one. The lady moved on. The lady yeah. was like, I'm good. I don't believe in that one. And <laughs> Okay. Which I mean, cool. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it just made everybody at the table laugh when she walked away. Yeah, it did. It was very funny. So, because we were doing that all day uh, yesterday, we just didn't have a chance to record. We also came home and went to bed at like seven o'clock. Oh, we, we were sure so did. Tired, so because we had to yeah. get up and be there by six forty-five. Yeah. Was it six forty-five? Wasn't it open? But we like got up at five and got stuff ready, and it was a lot. Mm-hmm. But we made a lot of money. Had a great time. Yeah. So. Had a great time. Huzzah. I'm so just this very is, tired. <laughs> this is what I came up with with the topic she gave me for our yes. stories today. It's going to be a lot of direct quotes. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, they're, they, they, these are not Southern stories because I like to keep the Southern ones for myself. I'm saying that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. But I didn't know you did it for selfish reasons. <laughs> oh, yeah. 100% selfish reasons. <laughs> so these are two Christmas themed stories. Yes. That are not from the South. Uh, the first one's actually from England. So there we go. England? England. Nice. Yeah, there are three syllables in that. And the first story we're going to talk about, Leah, since you already know the topics, I'm going to make it suspenseful for everybody else, is called The Warminster Thing. Ooh. Ooh. And that sounds like a cryptid when you read it, but the subtitle is A Christmas UFO Sighting. So... Let's get into it, everybody. Huzzah. So, again, most of this is direct quotes. I will source my stuff later. But I'm, I did a little bit of work, but we really <laughs> haven't had time. So I just kind of – normally when I put stuff together, I pull direct quotes and then I rearrange those things into the way that I would say them. Yes. Hasn't happened this time. So oh, right. <laughs> I'm going to try to okay. do that on the fly. Let's see what happens. All right. So, 1964 mm-hmm. in Warminster, Wiltshire, England – on Christmas Day, Leah, yes. a lady named Mildred Head, she awoke with a start, is what the article says, at one thirty <laughs> in the morning. So it was just past Christmas Eve. And, you know, that's rough. Uh, she later told a certain reporter, his name was, was Arthur Shuttlewood, that what woke her up was her ceiling had, quote, come alive with strange sha- strange sounds lashing at the roof. I'm having trouble talking already. What? There arose such a clatter. It's Santa Claus. There Exactly. There arose such a clatter e. that sounded like lashing at the roof. And be careful because Tim Allen's going to push you off the fucking roof. <laughs> yeah. he's He's got a murder streak in him. <laughs> he's what we call a Look, conservative American. Yeah, he's got I, a problem. I wouldn't put it past him. That's all I'm saying. So the article goes on to say that uh, she told Arthur Shuttlewood that it sounded like twigs brushing against the tiles and got louder and louder until it sounded like her house was being pelted by giant hailstones. So it got it. It, it was a problem. Like, oh, oh, my God, there's a, a Christmas hailstorm. Oh, no. Right, Leah? I've been caught in a fucking hailstorm. Yeah. You, you were driving. there. It was terrifying. I do not like hail. Like It's miserable. You think, oh, yeah, it's just ice. No, no. It's chunks of ice flying at you yeah. at terminal velocity, and it's terrifying. Well, no, that's something you. I meant to bring up before I even started. I said these are Christmas stories. For the past, I don't even remember how many Christmases here in Alabama, not just in Hartzell. It's rained every fucking Christmas day, mm-hmm. just every day. And it's not near cold enough to snow. It's like in the 50s, Yeah, and it's just pouring down rain. Yeah, there was a few Christmases ago. Um, yeah, 2015, I think, because I remember what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's a while. It fucking flooded. Yeah. You could have leg- and this is not an exaggeration or a joke of any kind. It started, like, it, it was torrential downpours 
all day long. There, mm-hmm. It did not slacken up. You could have rowed a boat down downtown Hartzell on mm-hmm. Main Street. You could have literally rowed a canoe and been perfectly fine. It, yeah. Everything flooded that year. It was the wettest Christmas. I think like it was fucking awful. Yeah, it was. I remember that one because I was going to fry a turkey that day. Yeah. And it stormed. So I did it on the porch, which was it was dangerous. Yes. But hey, it got done. It was it a good did. turkey, too. It did get done. And turkey. it was a really good turkey. So she got out of bed when she heard what she thought was hail and she didn't see anything out of her window. But she did hear something else that uh, it was, again, a sound that grew lo- louder as it went on started as a low humming sound and uh, it got progressively louder just this loud hum and then it says that it fainted to a faint whisper so that was the first report that people got of this but there i believe i have it later in the in my notes here but i believe like 30 something people reported something very similar that same night uh later on so a few hours later there were soldiers at something called uh, Nook Camp. It was an army base. And they heard what they thought sounded like, quote, a huge chimney stack from the main block ripped from the rooftop, then scattered across the whole camp. So again, something very loud, like hail almost. Very, very loud. And at 6.30 that same morning, a man named Roger Rump. <laughs> I just enjoy it. Man, British names are the best. And uh, it, he and his wife were awoken by a very similar noise. Uh, very loud, and they described it as sounding like, quote, the 5,000 tiles on our roof being ripped off and then put back on again with an enormous clatter. There arose such a clatter. Look, I feel Leon. like what we're headed towards is Santa Claus is just like, he yeah. got a little lit, yeah, he was, he's he was fucked up, and, and he's just like on. not doing great when it comes to driving the sleigh this year. Maybe Rudolph got a little tipsy, too, and yeah. he's just having a struggle bus. Yeah. That's all it sounds like to me. Yeah, they were having trouble parking <laughs> all night. <laughs> Have they, you ever tried to parallel a sleigh with nine fucking reindeer? They it's didn't di- leave a difficult. single note at all. <laughs> they just took off. So, Could you bet, like, just a hit and run from Santa and just yeah. doesn't leave a note? What a dick. Yeah, I know. And you better be putting down that as an episode title. <laughs> a hit and run from Santa. <laughs> okay. Leah. We have to uh, we have to maintain our options here. So at around the same time, again at about six thirty in the morning, a lady named Marjorie By was walking to church, and she was thrown to the ground by the force of quote savage sound waves. So again, just a major explosion type of thing, something very loud that knocked her to the ground. Uh, there it is. In total, more than thirty individuals reported hearing these things, and uh, there was more. That happened after Christmas. So nothing much came about from Christmas until February of the next year in 1965. And what's weird is the article doesn't go into this, but it's just hilarious. Okay. It was, quote, in February 1965, an entire flock of pigeons suddenly died. So I guess they were... Was that related in any way, or were they just saying, hey, by the way... That that occurred in Warminster. Mm. So I don't know if they were flying. I don't know if they were perched somewhere but it says an entire flock died and how much is a flock though a cl- right. flock could be five or six or it could be 112 you know i'm going I, with 112 that's a lot that'll make it creepier <laughs> okay and then the following month so march uh three different families heard very similar loud noises like the ones that heard on christmas right above their houses their roofs and windows all of that same kind of thing and then in june of that next year let me see here the Warminster residents, this is a quote, began to see unidentified objects flying through the sky. So there you go. But what, like, what, con- like, what did they look like? Because when you get a UFO sighting of any sort, well, they fall into categories. Are you about to ask me about that? No, no, no. It's not, it's not the shot in the dark, but okay. we are getting there because someone allegedly took a picture of it. Okay, cool. So there are, these are things that you can look up and see, which I'm sure you have. No, I have you. not. I actually did not so, look I mean, it looks like really terrible animation, like like a you know real grainy photograph. Like, what could this be? And it's like a a crappy negative of something that you don't have. So anyway, that's what happened. Um, But it got to uh, it grew to national attention. People flocked to Warminster so they could try to see something. And let's see, over the August bank holiday of 1965, I guess that's an English thing because I don't know. Yeah, there it is. See how crappy that is. 
That's the picture. Okay. Your, yeah, that's computer. a really shitty picture. <laughs> yeah, I told you. That's the picture. Okay. So, August bank holiday of 1965. I don't know what that is. I imagine it's an English holiday. No, um, any well, they call a bank holiday any time that like it's a national holiday where banks are closed. Okay, there you go. I don't know what Happened bank holiday August. falls in August, but... Well, it was estimated that about 8,000 people came to Warminster to just try to see it. Um, okay, the guy who uh, took that picture and claimed to have that picture, his name was Gordon Faulkner. And he gave it to the Daily Mirror, and they published the, f- the photo. And that's what drew a whole bunch of people there. And uh, by that time, even the U.S. had heard about it. So it started to gain a lot of attention here. And in 1966, Leah, the BBC filmed a documentary. Did you know about this documentary? I did not know about this oh, documentary. Oh, shot in the dark. Are you going to hit the thing? Mm. Or are we just going to sit here? Like, that's my job now. I'm yeah. sorry. All right, let's wait. The tablet went down. So okay, go ahead. Shot in the dark. There you go. You did great. What was the name of that documentary? The name of the documentary, it was... You know you're getting options. Oh. (laughs) You do know that you're getting options. Yeah, go ahead. I want to hear I was just going to come up with something stupid, but yeah. I want to hear what you have to say. Go Go ahead. ahead. No. No, Go ahead. Go ahead. No. All right. Here are your options for the name (laughs) of the documentary, Leah. We have A, Pie in the Sky. B, Christmas Biscuit in the Sky. Or C, all I want for Christmas is a UFO. Which one, Leah? I'm going with Christmas Biscuit in the Sky. I know that's probably not accurate, but it sounds English, and I want there to be a documentary called that. So okay. that's my answer. Uh, you are incorrect. Damn. So you need to give yourself a fail, Leah? Uh, beep, beep. <laughs> this is falling apart. This I'm is sorry. falling apart. Yes, but I am pouring myself a shot <laughs> gingerly. Yeah, you are. Very gingerly. It's A. It's pie in the sky. Which I don't know why. Because it looks like a pie plate in the sky. I guess. I guess. But, yeah. So, anyway, this this sighting, this thing, had a lot of attention for a long time. uh, But the the sightings started to fade away getting into the 70s. And it kind of left the cultural zeitgeist. For quite a while. How was that shot? You don't seem to enjoy it. Burns my lippies. <laughs> okay. So it wasn't it wasn't popular anymore for a long time, but but people do still remember it. They have commemorations. Um, let me see. Yeah, let they me, ha- they have events there occasionally. Let me clarify it. the shot. It burns my lippies. Phrase. My lips are chapped, and the alcohol uh, like got into them and burned them. I'm not like. My lips aren't weird. They're just chapped. Thank you very much. I'm done. Go ahead. (laughs) That's really all that that there is. That uh, Albert Arthur, not Albert, I'm sorry, Shuttlewood, uh, the reporter that the lady spoke to, he wrote several books about it. And even when it got into the 70s and it started to fade in popularity, he also stopped publishing things about it. And just it says that he retired from sky watching due to ill health i guess it takes you know being healthy to to walk outside and look but that's what happened so um they they do still commemorate it though they enjoy that they were i believe warminster is referred to as like the ufo capital of the uk or something like that because of this one thing Mm -hmm. so yeah that that's the warminster thing and my source for that was one article from mental floss uh so y'all could get on and watch that too or read that uh they probably have a video about it mental floss does a lot of videos so yeah um and that's the article i used right there look at you no that's the from bbc oh, okay yeah that's not um, the same thing it's just got um i did look at that one though yeah mm-hmm. um but apparently it's uh, 50th anniversary was in 2015 and um mm-hmm. yeah it's the photo of of like the person who took the pictures it's really bad yeah um but that's how all these things go they're either building miniatures or taking shitty pictures i really feel like there should have been like a miniature in this case because like that yeah that just looks like some overexposed bullshit like i know cameras (laughs) weren't great but man yeah it's really bad so (laughs) what are the odds on this having actually been santa claus uh pretty good fairly good i'd say uh yeah yeah it was most definitely santa claus just 
having a bad parking gear. You know how it is when you have one thing happen and Mm -hmm. you get frustrated, so it causes a line of other things? Like, he went to that Matilda lady's house. Not Matilda. That's the next thing. I'm sorry, y'all. Mildred. He went to Mildred's house, fucked up, and went, God fucking damn it, and then had Rex the rest of the night throughout the time because he was frustrated and worried about, you know, stressed about what he'd already done. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely see... (sighs) Because I'm bad at parking anyway. Just completely just letting everybody know. I'm super shitty yeah. at parking. Like, that's why I, s- I drive, like, a tiny car. I specifically drive a tiny, tiny car so I can park it anywhere because I- I'm bad at parking. Mm-hmm. But, like, I feel like <sighs> if I do one thing wrong when I'm driving, it it... Like I get the guilt and then like everything else goes wrong and it just, it doesn't stop until I go home and just sit and just stew about it. Like I hate being cut off in traffic. I hate accidentally doing something stupid in traffic. If I do something wrong while I'm driving, it like eats at me until I park and then I just feel bad the rest of the day. Like I cannot, I'm, I'm bad at driving. I don't like doing it. I have to do it, but I just don't. And I feel like Santa only drives the one time a year, right? So maybe his skills were a little iffy that week yeah it wasn't great he like fucked some shit up the first time and it was just this snowball effect of god damn you know and like maybe he came back and was like trying to fix his mistakes and oopsie doopsie ripped a chimney off or whatever it said like oopsie doopsie (laughs) i just like man i feel bad for santa that's all i'm saying i feel bad for santa too not necessarily because of this but because all the bullshit he has to put up with every year Right, Leah? I agree. Yes. So, yeah. I agree with you, Leah. That poor, poor old man (laughs) having to deal with your bullshit from year to year. Correct. But yeah, that's the end of the first story. So, do we want to take a little break? Let the camera cool down? Yeah. I, uh, like, I just, all of the alcohol hit me at one time. You're doing great. And I'm feeling a little buzzy right now. So, maybe we stop for a minute, let the thing cool down. Chill out for a minute, and then we come back okay. with a delightful story that I'm sure you'll be delivering us. Oh, yeah. You already know what the story is, yeah, but you haven't heard me tell it yet. I haven't, you, and I'm very excited. You wait so. till you hear me do it. Yeah. We'll see <laughs> okay. you uh, like right now if you're listening or watching, but like for us, it's going to be a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you all in a little bit. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for me to butcher another story. Who's ready? I'm ready. Leah's ready. Yes. Because Leah knows that she probably knows more than I'm about to tell her off off of this thing. Like she probably did on the first one. Probably. But you know what? I'm here to learn. So enlighten me. Educate me. That's not going to help. That's not going to be good. Yeah, well. I'm not going to learn you nothing. Leah? I want to be learned. Well. All right. Well, here we go. You ready? You sure? So ready. All right. Now we're going to talk about the story of a lady named Matilda Rooney. Leah, do you know what happened to Matilda Rooney? I know you do. I got this. Uh, Um, I was going to say, do you you really want me to say? Because yes, in fact, I do. On Christmas morning in 1885, actually Christmas Eve night of 1885 in the town of Seneca, Illinois, Matilda Rooney burst into flames spontaneously, they say. This is a case of spontaneous human combustion. Yes. So she did that, and her husband also died of ingesting, ingesting? That's not right. Of inhaling fumes from the fire, inhalation. He was found dead later. He he was still there. His body was there. She was not. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, So let's talk a little bit about spontaneous human combustion, okay? It's been talked about for a very, very long time, as we, you know, as anybody that knows these things knows, Leah. And I know because I had a phase. You had a spontaneous human combustion phase? I did. Episode title, Leah's spontaneous (laughs) human combustion phase. She somehow made it out. (laughs) She somehow got out of it. I did. The first time I ever heard about like a spontaneous human combustion or spawn you come, um, (laughs) No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh-uh. No. No. It's Go ahead. It's from... That Spawn Hugh Com is from one of my favorite episodes of a podcast called Blurry Photos. Um, yeah. And they were talking about spontaneous human combustion, and they nicknamed it Spawn Hugh Com, and it just made nope. me laugh. And no, I've they don't. And I've always thought of it 
as that since then. Go ahead, um, please. Anyway, the first uh, Spawn Hucom case that I ever saw was on Unsolved Mysteries, and I just, it fascinated me. I wanted to know more about it, so I literally, like, it, that was one of the first, like, online searches that I ever did as a kid was about spontaneous human combustion, and I learned absolutely everything I possibly could about different cases and whether it was real or not, and, like, I just vividly remember, like, fifth or sixth grade Leah just getting really interested about spontaneous human combustion and we can call it spc if you'd like spawn you come no we will not say that so uh, anyway spc leah has been in almost every instance thoroughly debunked but people still like to talk about it a lot because there are these unexplained events that usually happened before scientific advances were we're here like this one in 1885. We're just, we don't know what the hell happened to this lady. That's what they said pretty much in their report. We think it was SPC. I'm saying SPC. God damn it. So anyway, what's the P? I don't know. Spontaneous, I guess. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> SHC. S- I don't know why I'm S- <laughs> S- okay. SPC. Is- I'm going to say spawn you come. From now Thank on. you. Okay. Yes. Here we go. A right. win for Spawn Ucom. So Spawn Ucom <laughs> has, according to some of the sources that I found, um, an extensive literary pedigree. Authors, especially around the time of this, loved using Spawn Ucom in their stories, basically just to kill off characters. Like, we got to get rid of this person. Okay, he burst into flames. We're good. Dickens did it. It We're was going. great. Oh. Interesting that you say that, Leah. Yeah. Because I was about to ask you something. A lot of authors used it. A lot of authors used this around the time. But what famous author defended his use of Spawn Hucom fervently in the foreword to a book? It was Charles Dickens. Yeah, it was. It was Charles Dickens. Yes! But I was going to ask you. <laughs> Tell me the the um, question in that. Let's yep. let's do it like I didn't already okay. get the question right. In the foreword to a book. Okay. See, at, at the time, especially. Say shot in the dark books, so I can, can do this. Give me a second. Okay. I'm very excited. At the time, excited. especially, books were released serially first, mm-hmm. and then they would come out. So that's what happened with this book called Bleak House yes. by Charles Dickens. It had come out serially, and people were going... You know that Spawn Ucom doesn't exist, right? It's not real. And so in the foreword, he fervently was like, there have been a lot of uh, sci- scientists and doctors who say, we don't know what happened. They burst into flame. So I'm going to stick with them, is essentially what he said. Yes. So, shot in the dark. Oh. What famous author fer- fervently <laughs> defended his use of Spawn Ucom in his novel? A, Mark Twain. B. Charles Dickens. C. Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, I don't know, Mitchell. <laughs> it's such a hard decision. There you go. I. But what's really weird is you picked three of my favorite authors, which is very strange. Oh, yeah. Huge Tennyson fan, huge Twain fan. Dickens is okay, not my favorite, but he's the right answer. So yes. the fact that you picked two of my other favorite authors, just like, holy shit, Mitchell. You want to know Correct. how I did that? What? I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. It's not by paying attention to who your favorite <laughs> turn-of-the-century authors were. You just Googled who was a contemporary of Charles exactly Dickens. exactly what I did. Dickens contemporary authors. <laughs> Fucking, I knew it. God damn it. I like exactly. Dickens' stories, but like I'm not a huge uh, fan of the way he writes them. Yeah, here and I'm a huge Tennyson fan. I had a huge Tennyson um, phase. <laughs> As no one is surprised. Also, just a lifelong Mark Twain fan because I I think he's fun. But um, yep. also, Mark Twain's only as good uh, as he is remembered to be because his wife was a fabulous editor. So, yeah, um, that's my um. Yeah, Twain kind of sucked. Like he was prolific, but didn't have a way to organize his thoughts. Yeah, so his, his wife, wife really is the re- like he was very talented, but not focused. And she gave his writing the focus that it needed to be as successful as it was. Right. So, ten out of ten for Twain's wife. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So in Bleak House, Dickens had to get rid of a, a nasty character named Mister Crook. So that's how he did it. Mister Crook burst into flames, and just just out of nowhere. So that's it. 
It's there you go. Keep calm. We'll see y'all next week. And he was seriously like in the in the papers of the time. He was very seriously criticized. Everybody's like, yeah. "What an unbelievable fuck you!" And uh, Dickens has the g- ghosts of 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 uh, disgraced businessmen dancing around in a. Oh, maybe that's just the Muppet version. But anyway, you've got ghosts and all sorts of supernatural bullshit going on in a lot of. Dickens stories and the thing that people of the time were pissed about was spontaneous yeah. human combustion. That's one thing I was going to say. Is I don't like when people take entertainment no matter what it is and go well that's just unbelievable and you go yeah it's a fucking cartoon. What are you talking about? Of course it's unbelievable. It's supposed to be. It's entertainment. Also fuck you. I have an incredibly intense desire to watch the Muppets Christmas Carol sometime okay. very soon. So we'll do it today. Just putting that out there. Well, Leah, that right is now, the best and most definitive version of it that is. It, it literally movie. is. We've talked about it on this show. Yes. Before I'd never watched it because I don't care about the Muppets or Christmas Carol. <gasps> Excuse me, good God! But that is the best version of that story. Period. Best Scrooge. It's so good. Best Marley's. Yes. Okay, mm. beside the point. We'll watch it today. It's 12.30 right now. Yes. We got time. So, anyway, let's get back to Matilda Rooney. So, the investigators, when they first got there, had no reason to suspect foul play. They couldn't find an ignition point. Uh, they couldn't find any, like, no weapons were used or anything. The only thing that they had was the Rooneys were older, and they liked to drink a lot. So, they had essentially given control of their farm to number one their son john who didn't live with them and number two a farmhand also named john who did live there and on christmas eve john had gone to bed about eight o'clock and said that they had been drinking heavily which they always did he said that they were prolific whiskey drinkers and the investigator said yeah we found evidence of the whiskey and all of this but but john uh we'll get to why john is not suspected of anything later john the farmhand i should probably Distinguish, distinguish between the two and weirdly in most of the spawn Hucom cases that you'll find a very common through link is that the people were alcoholics like that yes. is a very standard feature of spontaneous human combustion stories yeah. is that generally speaking almost all of the victims of spawn Hucom were very intense drinkers and that's one of the mm-hmm. theories as to why it happens is that like their body was just incredibly flammable because of all of the alcohol which is not how alcohol works mm-hmm. just for the record but that is a very prominent feature of the stories of spontaneous hum- human combustion from yep. the tom it is and and that's part of uh what we're going to get to later i don't have i have about that much detail so that's perfect you know basically <laughs> uh the investigators of the incident also they there was almost nothing left of matilda there it was just a pile of ash a few fragments of bone and very weirdly her feet in her shoes oh in the kitchen. i love it when the feet are left and that was it that's what they found of her now her husband's body again was all there he was on the floor of the bedroom he had died from smoke inhalation john the farmhand was able to escape the house so let's get into a little bit more uh, John Larson was the the uh, the farmhand. Uh, there we go. That was his name. So let's see. Uh, like I said, he went to bed about eight o'clock that night, and he reported that he woke up in the middle of the night briefly, remembering having trouble breathing, but he fell back asleep. And he told them that he didn't awake until Christmas morning. And when he came downstairs, he uh, well, he first awoke to this weird acrid smell. And came downstairs and there was just kind of not really smoke left, but kind of a haze left, you know, like we we burn something in the oven that happens way too often. And there's just like a haze in the house. And uh, he said, let's see, there was soot on his pillow and around the bed where he had been sleeping. So what the doctors found, you know, I told you they found a few fragments of bone and stuff. In total, they found a human skull a cervical bone, some vertebrae, and six inches of a right femur and badly burned ilium. I don't know what an ilium is. What is that? It's just another bone. Bone in the foot, in the leg? Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. And then here's the part where we're talking about her feet. Most shocking was the discovery of two badly burned but still recognizable feet in Matilda Rooney's shoes. 
Like just, I don't know if they were standing in a spot or if they were like, you know, separated or whatever. But See, that's fucking weird. Yeah, no, and that's one of my favorite things about spontaneous human combustion is that generally speaking, the hands and the feet fall off. A lot of the times the feet will be left behind yeah. or the hands will be left behind or both. Mm-hmm. Weirdly, so I don't want to take your story over, so I'm going to stop yeah, thank you. there. But there are several We can do features. more spontaneous comms later. SPCs, I call them. That makes no sense. <laughs> There's several features that are very common throughout most spontaneous human combustion cases. Yeah. And the fact that the feet fall off are, is very yeah. common. Yeah. I don't know that it fell off. Well, they bu- <laughs> everything burns but the feet right. or the hands. Right. So, uh, it just, again, interestingly, about her burning, they say that she weighed about 160 pounds at the, right before this happened. And what was left was 12 pounds of ash. So, that's it. That's what happened to this lady. And it's fucking crazy. So, again, about the alcohol thing, I'm going to just direct quote this, okay? In trying to support this theory, both the doctor and police pointed to the large amount of alcohol, which included primarily whiskey, that the couple had consumed the previous day. The belief at the time was that a buildup of gases in the body and the rising of the blood alcohol level could lead to a risk of the body self-igniting as body heat and gases grew to a level the body couldn't handle. Again, this is also quoted in the article. This has been mostly disproven in modern lab studies in which an external source of combustion is always needed. So, again, uh, Spahn-Hucom is generally not seen as even close to an option. Even in these old ones where science hadn't advanced enough to know specifically what happened to this lady. But they still go, well, we don't have anything else. So, we don't know. Uh, Usually they're trying to say, well, we'll get into it. We'll, We'll get into it. So... There are a couple of theories about what happened that don't necessarily include Spahn Hukam, Leah. One of them could be murder. Murder. Maybe. So I'm going to read you just all of these, (laughs) almost everything I'm going to say. What? My brain just did a thing and it made me laugh. Okay. Well, tell us. Share it with the class. (laughs) (laughs) Leah. (laughs) Fucking shit. We are all, we are live. Right now. A flaming body. So burn it, maybe. You know, oh like something God. like All right. that. No, you're right. You should have just kept that. Spontaneous hum. Keep that in the head. combustion. <laughs> My body's flaming. Right. It's murder, maybe. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. All right. That's fine. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm All sorry. Right. So I'm going to read you some direct quotes here. Like I said, they had a son, John Rooney. They had John Larson, who was their farmhand who lived there. So let's see. Uh, Let's just go into the quotes. Early in the investigation, suspicion had fallen on John Larson, who had been spending Christmas Eve with the couple. Suspicion was also placed on John Rooney, the couple's son, as he may have stood to gain by his parents' deaths. John Larson was later cleared of any foul play due to the presence of an outline in the bed he had slept in that showed his shape, which supported his claims that he slept through the events of that night. The dude slept through all of that. Like, you know, he woke up. He may have had such low oxygen from inhaling fumes that it put him right back to sleep. And he slept in the same spot. He didn't toss and turn all night. So there was just a clean bit of bed underneath all the soot that surrounded in the room. What kind of lumpy, shitty bed was he in that that stayed? Fucking right? That is fucked up. But that not that weird how you can be cleared of just like, well, none of the smoke is here. <laughs> See my body? <laughs> you like you like the shape I of my didn't body? I did do it. <laughs> doing, oh. doing snow angels in the bed, just trying yeah. to prove himself yeah. as innocent? Soot angels. I like it. Uh, uh, and, and the couple's son, John Rooney, meanwhile, was cleared as no evidence could be found that an accelerant had been used to cause the fire and the lack of signs of injury on his father other than suffocation from inhaling the fumes of the fire. So he didn't... If if he did murder them by lighting his mother on fire, he didn't hurt anybody else, you know. And again, they couldn't find an accelerant, so there. Um, but interestingly enough, the farmhand, John Larson, he died just over two weeks later from lung damage, and his autopsy showed he had a buildup of the same soot and greasy residue in his lungs that had killed the husband, Patrick Rooney. I hadn't even said his name yet. So Matilda's husband was Patrick. He died from inhalation. And two weeks later, the farmhand also died of inhalation after surviving that night. So that's kind of fucked up, too, don't you think? Yes. 
But I do have in my notes here that, uh, but if you ask me, it was probably the deep state as inhaling smoke leaves no lasting damage to the lungs. That's just government hoopla. So I do have that in there. Um, so if you think, I mean, if you've ever been in a fire, you know it's just a bad flu. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, and you're, you're fine to get over it. So anyway, there's also a theory it could have just been an accident, which is what most Spawn Hucom cases are generally decided upon. It's almost always someone who, like Leah said, was an alcoholic who has fallen asleep with a lit cigarette in their hand. That hap- that it happens, almost all the Spawn Hucom cases end up being that, or at least are said to be something along those lines. So what we have in this one, um, let's see, I'm just going to go right into the quote again. It has been claimed for some time that Matilda Rooney could have easily ignited by coming into contact with a source of heat or flame. In this case, both the buildup of alcohol in her body and the wick effect, a process whereby the body's fat and clothing act like a candle, keeping the fire from spreading beyond it would have come into effect. So there was a candle found in the house. They said that she was so drunk, she could have stumbled into the candle essentially, but she was just so riddled with alcohol that it just kept it right there. You know, that's what they say. Um, The suggested source of heat that ignited Matilda Rudy was either that candle that was partially burned on the table or a cigarette she may have been attempting to light from the candle at the time of her death. So she could have picked the candle up, trying to light the cigarette like we were just talking about. And again, the sources I have say this would be the most plausible explanation. But at the time of her death, the the theory of Spawn-Hucom was more widely reported. It does not say Spawn-Hucom. I shortened it. So... I can't, the truth is, nobody actually knows what happened to her. It, it's ju- it was a lot easier to just say, well, this bitch burned it, bust into flame. What are we going to do? Yeah. Bust? Burst. Burst. She didn't bust into flame, Leah. <clears throat> so, my sources on that one are uh, Britannica.com. They had a, a case mostly just about Spawn Hucom, but her story was included in it. And I got a lot of stuff from Reddit on that one. Somebody did a deep dive into this case and gave all of I did verify everything that these people said in other areas, but I, I'm not quoting them because I got all of my actual information from the Reddit post that all of this came from. So, excuse me. So yeah, most likely she was trying to light a cigarette burst into flame because at the time is 1885. Everything's flammable, everything. And she's coated in alcohol by by all reports, they drank a lot. So she probably lit like a nightgown on fire, whatever she was wearing, and just kind of sat there and burned, you know, but nothing else in the house burned from what they said. So spawn you come, right, Leah? Yes. Even her feet were still there. Yes. And see, okay. Don't drink with your feet. <laughs> Actually, it's not <laughs> the alcohol of the feet that has anything to do with it. It's the fat content of the feet is what yeah. the theory is. Yeah, because everybody's got skinny feet. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily. I have kind of chunky feet myself, but <laughs> um, so can I like take a deep dive into Spawn Hucom just for a minute because it's one of my favorite things. Please. Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry. And this is off the cuff and I'm sorry if I'm wrong about something, but this is how I understand it. So spontaneous human combustion in the Victorian era was generally... There was a book that was written by some medical dude at some point that sort of um, sort of went over commonalities that, uh, you know, were occurring in these particular SPCs. spawn Hucom cases yes. because they were a lot more frequent and, and widespread than you think they were, um, which is fascinating and interesting on its own merits but he wrote a whole book i don't remember the name or the dude who wrote it i'm sorry but he comes up with like a whole list of things that are really generally something that it's a list of common characteristics that are involved in spontaneous human combustion cases so they're usually alcoholics which is the main thing most of the time they're elderly women it's not always um but a lot of the times they're elderly women um, most of the time, the feet uh, fall off or the hands don't burn. Uh, usually the outer extremities, hands and feet, don't burn with the rest of the body. Um, a lot of the time, 
the fire doesn't cause damage to the rest of the household. Um, and most of the time they will report having a weird greasy film over everything else that was in the rest of the household. Every uh, My notes have that in there. I just didn't say it, but there was yeah. like a greasy soot coating the walls. Yeah. They throughout. say that they're like, it's just this greasy, stinky, nasty mm-hmm. film that covers acrid everything. Smell. Yeah. The acrid smell. Yeah, it's supposed to be disgusting. Um, yeah. That's just over everything else in there. And a lot of the times, especially in Victorian eras, um, like, I mean, nowadays there's not a lot of open flames in homes unless you, you know, have gas heating of some sort. And even then it's a pilot light on an oven or a boiler or whatever. Um, But in modern days, there's not a lot of open flame unless you're like a candle addict or you smoke cigarettes inside. Um, Back then, obviously, open fireplaces were a key source of heating, um, candle light. Um, lamp lights, all of that stuff was very common. And um, a lot of the people that died of Spawn Hucom were also smokers. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the, in that particular book, they kind of break it down as they don't think it's spontaneous human combustion. It's most likely, um, you know, some of the in- incredibly flammable materials that they were using in the time period. Um the, and, they got lit by one of the common household fire hazards. If I can interject into that, talking about uh, the, the flammable materials, as I said, almost everything that I've ever seen about spontaneous human combustion is a person sitting in a chair mm-hmm. falling asleep with a lit cigarette. So that brings me to another point. If y'all have never gone to a bonfire where somebody burned a couch or a, a chair, because we have... And the couch is gone in literally 20 seconds. Yeah, it's gone. terrifying. Gone. The, the rate and, at which modern furniture right. burns is insane. Right. And that's what actually causes a problem in a house fire. The house itself, of course, is made of wood in general and is flammable. It's flammable, but it doesn't burn at that same rate. the biggest problem in mm-hmm. a house fire. And you have to get away from shit. And quickly. also, so a lot of the times modern materials are made with flame retardants especially like i know i've talked about this before but you know modern uh, especially children's pajamas have to be flame retardant yeah um a lot of the materials that you use for everyday like clothes are federally re- mandated to be flame retardant in some mm-hmm. way um that wasn't a thing back then and a lot of people were using natural fibers and natural fi- fibers bore burn more quickly Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, combust more readily than a lot of the synthetic blends that we wear today. Um, So, yeah, if you fall asleep in a chair and there's alcohol around and it's not even that the alcohol is doing a lot to facilitate the burning itself because a lot of experiments have been done and there's not a huge difference uh, Mm -hmm. in bodies burning on their own versus bodies burning that have consumed a lot of alcohol because the way the body metabolizes it it really doesn't make that much of an effect but the fact that you're drunk means that you're way more likely to do something stupid like falling asleep with a lit cigarette or falling asleep next to a burning can or tripping into the fireplace you know um Excuse me, shit like that. So it's not really that the alcohol itself is working as an accelerant. It's that you make really stupid choices around open flames when you're drunk. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I just think it's incredibly fascinating. But also when you think about the temperatures that have to be achieved to burn a human body as thoroughly as these bodies are burned, um, the fact that none of the rest of the stuff nearby burns is kind of crazy because uh, you have to reach about 1800 degrees to actually burn a human body yeah. um, like as thoroughly and completely as they do in like a contained oven space it takes a lot of fuel to cremate a body um, and for whatever reason these bodies go up and burn and they don't catch everything else on fire I don't know I find it fascinating and there's honestly not a complete explanation for all of these cases it's just some general um, this is most likely what happened. This is how it probably um, occurs, but there's nothing definitive about these cases. And I mean, a lot of people even dispute the wick effect being a thing at all. Yeah. A lot of people are like, yeah, I mean, fat burns, but not in the way that would continually keep um, a fire burning, especially if there's no through source of oxygen. I mean, it's there's a lot of stuff about this, and I have 
truly gone in depth in the past and I won't bore you with um, the rest of my thoughts on the subject, but I'm just saying Thank it's you. incredibly fascinating. So if anybody's interested, the information's out there and I highly recommend all the Spawn Hucom cases um, because they're fun. Yeah. Um, and not fun because people are dead, no, but fun. fun in the fact that it's a mystery, it's weird, and there's so many of these, like... And they're fun. Situ- I mean, there's... In that book, I believe there were, like, two or three hundred of these cases that they go over. Yeah. Um, so, like, it is not an uncommon thing. It's more uncommon today, once again, because there's not as many open sources of flame in a household. Um, to me, if, like... If if someone did spontaneously human combust in this year, like someone's gonna have it on TikTok, you know? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It will be recorded somewhere. Yeah, it would be recorded in some way. So I really think the lack of open flames in the home really has done away with the spawn hucom situations. Um but that was one of my first anxieties was I was worried I was going to spontaneously burst into flame. Um, so I did a lot of research and decided never to drink alcohol because of that. I mean, I changed my mind later, but you know, that is legitimately one of the reasons that I didn't have a drop of alcohol until I was well into college. Because you thought you were going to burst into flame? Yeah, legitimately. That Leah, Jesus Christ. (laughs) I mean, not... Not entirely, but that I mean, the, the fact that I was a Baptist and I was scared of bursting into flames, um, for, you know, for being a Baptist. Yes. I mean, there a was Baptist? a spiritual level and there was a spawn you calm level. And, you know, they were both terrifying. But yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Leah's brain. Yeah. So that's my mild <laughs> obsession. I'm drunk and I'm sorry for everything that I've said Are you thus drunk? far. I'm not drunk, drunk, but I'm feeling it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you did great, Leah. Yeah. Sorry about that. You also did great. Thank you for those yeah, stories. Yeah, I'm sure I did wonderful work that no one was bored at all. I was fascinated. Yeah, but you love Spawn Ucom. It's true, I do. Which, speaking of, that, uh, that allowed me to update my toast, uh, which makes it flow a little better because oh, good. spontaneous human combustion is hard to fit into one line of it a poem. It is. It is. So Spawn Ucom shortens it, makes it flow a little bit better. Okay. So well, I'm very open, ready, and willing to hear that toast you if sure? you want to make it. I mean, it's real bad. Oh, I revel in the bad. Because when I do these things, the toast is always the very last part. And I go, son of a bitch, I just got to throw something together. So yeah, this one's this is not good. Okay. Are you ready? So ready. Okay. Well, here we go. Let's everybody raise your sun lab high into the sky or whatever you've got. Let's toast our Christmas stories for the week. Here we go. Everyone was awoken one early Christmas morning by Santa's bad bad driving. God damn it. Let's start over. Okay. Everyone was awoken one early Christmas morning by Santa's bad driving. He gives no forewarning. Like he doesn't have a horn on the thing, you know? Honk, honk. Like the deers have horns, but they're antlers. Anyway. Honk, honk, Christmas fucker. Second one, here it comes. Spawn Hucom isn't real, so don't fret. Merry Christmas to all. I hope yours isn't wet. Drink. Wet. Like with the rain? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> oh, that made it. That made the whole episode for me. Was to just finish it up and you go... Wet. That was perfect. I really appreciate that. I have had most of this beer oh, in no. a shot and a whole, like a lot of this whiskey on ice. If any of y'all have ever listened to any stand up, you know that this is what white people do when they get a little turnt. They have to say everything, they have to list off everything they've had. I do it too. I absolutely do it too. Oh, yeah. This He's is where to... I am. Let me, get, let me give you everything that's happened it's, the last three years. It's hours. been a lot. <laughs> I don't generally drink this much on the show, and you know I what apologize you gotta do? for all of the things that I've said, and, and I'm sorry. You know what you got to do? What's that? You got to do the outro. Oh. Um, Are we doing the outro? All right, go. Yes. Our outro is, um, thank you for listening to the Southern Spirits podcast. Um, we hope you had an excellent time, and yep. you don't unsubscribe because Leah got drunk. This is what we do every um, time. You should send us postcards at P.O. Box 1743. Hearts of Alabama 35640. You should follow us on social medias. We have a Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram. 
Just search us, you'll find us. Mm -hmm. Or not, but you should. It'll be fine. With TikTok as well. Um, we have a TikTok, but I haven't posted anything to For that in very months long because time. of anxiety. And, um... <laughs> merch. Merch. We have a merch store. Um, YouTube, if, you, if you're not watching on YouTube. Yeah, if you want to merch store, you can merch store. There's merch, and it's a store. If you want to YouTube us, we're there too. You can see me getting drunk with pictures. Um, not with pictures, like... Moving pictures. Moving pictures. To be specific. Video. There's video of this <laughs> podcast, and there's a delightful cat sitting in a box on the table. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Is there anything I'm mitching? M mitching? <laughs> you are mitching. We're good. Okay, we're good. So, um, thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>